All right. Hello, David. Thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I was I was only recently introduced to your books. I binged two of your previous books. Then this one came out. So today we're talking about your new book, How God Works. And and yeah, so this is a topic that I'm pretty passionate about because I'm a recovering drug addict, mm. uh, sober in 12-step meetings, and I was afraid of the whole God thing until I started learning about this stuff. So for those who have yet to pick up the book, what what inspired this book? What's it kind of about and all that? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, people often ask me, Dave, you're a scientist. Why are you writing about God? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I was, I was raised, I was raised Catholic, but then I, you know, I kind of left the church and I'm not particularly religious right now, but I run a psychology lab where for the past 20 years, we've been focused on trying to, to find ways to help people live better lives. Like, and as, as you said, my other books are on things like, like gratitude and compassion mm -hmm. and honesty and generosity and how do we do these? And so we spend our time trying to, you know, devise little tactics and life hacks whenever it might be that help people but every time we find one i look around and i'm like wait a minute they already use this in religion <laughs> yeah so, i mean sure you know they didn't they didn't understand i mean they can't scan your brains or run randomized control trials but they intuited this and so i when you look at the data people mm -hmm. who saying you believe in god doesn't matter but people who actually daily and reg daily weekly engage with religious or spiritual practices live longer are happier and are healthier and so as a scientist i want to know why and what it seems to be and i'm sure what we'll talk about today is that a lot of these practices just help people meet the challenges of life and so the question is whether you believe whether you're a believer or not i don't want to touch on the question of god exists that's not a question science can answer right mm -hmm. i mean even if you're an atheist it's 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 on faith that probability favored us in this corner of the universe. There is no test. Even Richard Dawkins, the world's most famous atheist, will tell you he can't be sure God doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But we all care about making life better. So let's look at how this stuff works. And we've kind of done it with meditation, right? We know meditation helps people in lots of ways, but it can't be a fluke, right? There mm -hmm. must be other spiritual practices too. And I'll be interested in, you know, in, in, in your thoughts too. You know, a lot of addiction programs do things like self-compassion and and, mm -hmm. and 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 gratitude journaling and pride coins and all of this stuff and so um my take here is let's figure out what these tools are and how can we adapt them to make life better for everyone you don't you don't need to know how where technology came from to yeah use it, right that's my message yeah, no, ab absolutely. And I, and I love what you just said right there. Like we, you know, we, we use our cell phones every day. Right now, you and I are talking over Zoom, right? And I don't think either of us are experts in how the internet works and, you know, or how our cell phones work and stuff like that. But, you know, we drive cars. There's so many things that, you know, we don't know how they work. We just know that they work. And I think that's kind of what I found when I got sober, because I was a chronic relapser, right? And, you know, uh, I had no money, no health insurance, like so many people struggling with addiction and they're like hey here's 12 step programs they're free right and they were at churches i'm way too smart right i'm way too smart for any of this religious nonsense and they kept telling me like listen you can work these programs without being religious i'm like yeah sure but finally i went in there and i realized exactly what you talk about in this book i can do the practices whether or not I believe, right? And I think you touch on something, you know, uh, you know, you just touched on it and it's, you know, said greatly in your book too. Like, like if we look around, we see that there are people doing these things and they're happy. They're living better lives, right? Like I grew up here in Las Vegas. There's actually a lot of people from the Mormon church here in Las Vegas, right? And while I don't, you know, agree with all aspects of the religion, I, you know, I grew up you know, miserable. I struggled with depression. I would look at their, their families. I'm like, how are you guys so happy? You know what I mean? But it was from these, this faith, these practices, the connectivity and all that. But, you know, one of the things I, I wanted to get your perspective on, like, especially when it comes to like addiction, people are dying by the thousands. Like the recent report from 2020 was like 93,000 drug related deaths in the United States. Right. And I worked in addiction treatment for a few years. And the main block is we call it the God thing, right? Mm. So, you know, when you, you, you talk about this in the book and you've been researching this, what do you think that block is? Like, do you think it's like 
us just thinking we're too smart for this or, you know, like I, I'm curious what, what you've seen through, throughout your research. Let me just make sure I understand you, right? When you're saying the God thing, you mean the block is thinking you have to believe in God and you feel like I don't want to do that. Yeah. Or yeah. Or just any of the practices, like why, why do people think that they can't do the practices? You know, they can't even touch it. Yeah. You know well, I mean? you know, I mean, I think it's because a lot of these practices are, are wrapped up in, in kind of institutional religions. And, you know, it's an interesting question. I'll get back to your point on addiction in a second. But right now, people are leaving institutionalized religion in droves. I mean, this is the first year, you know, since Gallup started asking the question in the 1930s that the majority of Americans do not identify as belonging to a church, a synagogue, or a mosque. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is... Some of it, it's, it's scandals, financial or otherwise. Some of it, you just don't agree with the policy anymore. But a lot of the people who are leaving are not becoming atheists. They're looking mm. for new ways to be spiritual. And I think it's because on some level, they, they realize there are these tools. And so I think this idea of the God thing, as you're saying, gets in the way for a lot of people. I, and I'm not saying that that belief in God isn't important. For a lot yeah. of people, it's, it's, it's a very important factor that gives a lot of benefits. But these tools can be taken out of traditional religions. It's not cultural appropriation. We're not taking the prayers. We're not doing yeah. all that stuff. But we're, but we're just looking at these practices that you can incorporate in a completely secular way. And they're not owned by any one religion. A lot of these you'll see in multiple religions. And I think that that helps people. I mean, look, so, so I don't know if you did this, right? But, but I, know, I know like gratitude plays a big role in oh, AA yeah. programs, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we know in our research is when people cultivate a feeling of gratitude, it increases their self-control, it increases their patience, it reduces their impulsivity, right? These are all things that help you when you're dealing with addiction. And so we get the same results whether people report I'm feeling grateful to God or I'm feeling grateful to my parents or I'm feeling yeah. grateful to the guy who let me on the highway. It's just that religion by, by ritualizing these practices and making them something you do regularly, right? If you're a Christian, you say grace at every meal. If you're a Jew, when you wake up every morning, you say the moda ani, which is thank you, God, I'm, I'm for letting me wake up this morning. By cultivating those things, right, it's going to push mm -hmm. our minds in, in certain ways. And, and if you look at it as a tool, I think it helps you get beyond the God thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, too, because, you know, I, I read a ton. I love psychology. And it seems like just intuitively the gratitude thing makes sense, right? Like because we're prone for this like negativity bias and, you know, we spot the bad and all these other things. But gratitude, like you said, it played such a huge role. Like when I, when I for example, when I got sober, I had nothing. I wasn't allowed to see my son. I had no money. My friends wouldn't talk to me. Like it was mm -hmm. bad, right? But, you know, even, you know, weeks or months into my sobriety, and I was still trying to get on my feet, still didn't really have anything. I was, I was, uh, you know, they taught us to be grateful for those little things. And just yesterday, I was talking with another author about uh, his book was on, you know, the political landscape and, you know, all the polarization and anger. And everybody thinks, you know, right now, like their, their certain population is getting screwed, right? And we were talking about gratitude. And, you know, the last thing I'll say about gratitude, it's something that, when my son, he's 12 now, when he was about seven, eight years old, I got him a journal and part of his day was writing five things he's grateful for, right? Had him do that daily as a ritual. And, and like you were saying, that's completely secular, right? And therapists even use this practice. So have you, you know, you, you've, you've done the research, you've seen the science and something simple like a gratitude list. Um, do you see, do you see certain resistance with some of the practices you've seen? Like this seems really easy, right? Like meditation is a little bit harder, but is this something yeah. that is, is like most people are like, okay, I'll, I'll at least try it. I didn't, you know, I don't think people for gratitude journals, I don't think some people think it's, it's, oh, that sounds just kind of fluffy or silly, you know, new agey stuff. But, you know, I mean, this is my job, right? So it's my job to show you the data, right? Mm. There's lots of pop psychology that's nonsense. <laughs> and so yeah. It's oh, my absolutely. job as a research scientist to actually show you the data. But, you know, I mean, just to give you an example, we'll bring people into the lab and we'll either have them count their blessings and, and recall things that they're grateful for, do a gratitude journal, or we set up crazy scenarios where, you know, their computer crashes and they have just done all this work and they're losing it. And then somebody who's an actor comes in and helps them and they feel gratitude. We get the same results. So one thing we'll do is 
will give them the opportunity to flip a virtual coin and heads, they get a lot more money than tail. So we can mm. know who's cheating and who's not, you know, on average, 53% of people cheat, but if they're feeling grateful when they do it, it drops to like 25%. Mm-hmm. Um, people are much more willing, not only to help people who they feel grateful toward, but if I'm, if you just help me out, Chris, and I'm feeling grateful to you. When I go outside, if someone asks me for help, it also makes me more likely to pay mm. it forward. It makes me more patient, more future oriented. And so I, as you're saying, you know, I, I think these practices can be done in a secular or, or a religious way, it just kind of makes it happen every day. And mm-hmm. that's the trick. So there are lots of people who, who say, okay, I'm going to gratitude journal, but then they get home after a long day of work and they're like, I'm just too tired. Right. And they yeah. don't do it. But the benefit of of the religious way of doing it is you have to do it, right? Yeah. And so it makes you do it. Yeah. So one of the, one of the things, you know, aside from gratitude, is is you talk uh, a bit in the book about this this uh, topic of stress, anxiety, and how faith kind of counteracts that. So I would I would almost guarantee that anybody listening to this episode struggles with stress right? Whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's bills, kids, whatever, right? So this, this was one of the biggest benefits I found because I I struggled with just extreme anxiety, you know, and uh, like I was diagnosed with a generalized anxiety disorder. And aside from like, you know, working with a therapist and a doctor and medications, like having this kind of faith, even though I teeter between like atheist and agnostic most of the time, this idea of faith really helped me out, right? This kind of letting go. Uh, and from what I found, it's because I'm a control freak. I want to know, hey, if I do this, I'm going to get these results. Yeah. And then if it doesn't work, I lose it. So if you could, for all the beautiful people out there, if you can kind of break down how, what you've seen or what you've researched between how faith helps reduce reduce stress or anxiety. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a huge point. And, and I think you said something really important there, which was I'm a control freak and I, I just need to <laughs> let it go, right? And so that, that's the issue. So, so stepping back, the big issue, and I think it was Barry Schwartz who coined this term, right? There, there's like the tyranny of choice, mm. right? We, when we're always trying to control everything, it stresses us out, right? Because you're running every if-then possibility simulation mm-hmm. in your head over time. And there's lots of work showing that when you give people too many choices, even over mundane things, they find it stressful. So you can imagine when it's important things in life. And you know, there's this work by, uh, by Mickey Inslet, who's a, a neuroscientist at Toronto, that shows people that have stronger faith when they look at um, their brain's responses to making choices and potentially mm. making errors. It's almost like a bomb, right? They show less, less oh shit, oh no, I've got to do this right. And so what it means is when you have belief, um, it means that you don't have to always feel like you're trying to maximize everything. I mean, it doesn't mean you give over everything and don't think about it. It doesn't mean you don't try and make good choices, but you can let go a little bit and you can feel like, okay, there's something else out there that is going to try and control things and, and make things make things better and and has my best interests at heart. Now, you may think that that's a delusion, mm-hmm. right? And and that's and that's causing harm, but in in terms of stress it's actually better. But even even Buddhists, right, who may not believe in a divine entity the way we normally think of it, mm-hmm. have this idea of of letting go. Like why worry about something if you if you can't really control it, right? Do the best you can. Mm-hmm. And so having some faith, some belief is uh, correlated with you know lower depression, lower anxiety, lower stress. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean for people who are who are completely against the idea of a of a, of a theistic God who's coming in and, and manipulating everything in your life that you have to buy into that. Um, but it does mean you can kind of adopt certain principles like like Buddhism does about what you can worry about, what you shouldn't try to control, how you can be more accepting mm-hmm. and not kicking yourself if you feel you're going to make the wrong decision, et cetera. Yeah, it, it's, and as you were talking about that, it's so interesting how all of this kind of ties in together. So just, just for example, like real quick, like in 12-step programs, they teach us the serenity prayer, which is all about control, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, it, it's like, hey, let me focus on the things I can't control let go of the things that I right. can't. And, you know, I've been really interested. Uh, I loved your book on like, kind of like trust and everything. And mm-hmm. something, you know, uh, 
uh, I started reading into as well was like self delusions, right? Like why why do we evolve to lie to ourselves, right? And <laughs> if if we didn't, like why would I why would I reach for example why would I reach out to you to see if you want to come on the podcast, right? I have to have some kind of faith that maybe you'll say yes or like hey maybe I'm good enough, you know whatever, and that kind of works out, and that you know that kind of makes sense with this kind of like faith reducing like some stress, some depression, but. When you when you look at uh, you know some of the child development research and and I want to dive into you, you talk about like you know raising kids and these kind of like practices and stuff but even with children you know uh, we we've seen that it's better to have them focus on the effort rather than the result you know mm -hmm. and that's kind of a practice that's great for us adults as well and that's kind of letting go of that right because we're we're taking into account what we can control and not what's going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, is that, yeah. is that anything you've researched particularly? Um, I, I don't in, in particular, but there's a lot of people who do. And mm. I, I think you're hitting on the, you know, on the point there, that is we have to um, focus more on, on the process mm. than, than always worrying about the goal down, down the line. Um, and it's also important to have, you know, self-compassion for yourself. And what I mean by self-compassion is when you put in a good faith effort and you fail, don't condemn yourself, right? Self-compassion doesn't mean just like, ah, I was supposed to go to the gym today. I just sat on the couch. Well, that's fine. No, that's, you know, that's not self Self-compassion is I did my best and it didn't work out, but tomorrow I'm going to get up and do it again. And, and I'm not going to be self-critical because mm. if you are self-critical, so if you feel guilt or if you feel shame, in the moment, that can be a powerful motivator, but over time, it's really toxic. So the best way to think about it is, is to have more positive states, like take pride in each little step that you do as you're moving towards something, right? Mm -hmm. Take, you know, forgive yourself when, when, when you try and, and, and you do these things. And I think all these ideas about, about, about the process rather than focusing on, on me and my ego and where I'm going helps yeah. people deal with these with these with these stresses a bit yeah yeah and and something something i think that you you make a great point about uh, i believe it's in the introduction is that so many people you know uh, uh who are atheists just you know non-believers and stuff we're already doing a lot of this stuff we just don't realize it and i think that's helpful too because it's like oh i'm already doing half these things but but mm -hmm. you know you have uh you kind of you kind of lay out the book in like you know infancy to like young adulthood and everything like yeah that. follows so, the path of life exactly yeah, yeah i love it um so can you can you talk a little bit like i need people to go out and get the book but like as parents right when we first have a kid can you talk about some of the the rituals and how you know they're helpful like you talk about like naming or or just even like uh what i love was like the sunk cost fallacy of taking care of our kids and, yeah, sure, and stuff like that. that yeah so you know one of anybody who's a parent knows that of course you love your child but but there are trying times <laughs> yeah. um and you know unfortunately a, a small percentage of, of of new parents because of the stress and anxiety they're feeling have a hard time bonding to their kids right it's nothing to be ashamed of it happens the question is how do we how do we all strengthen those bonds with our kid and what you were talking about there is, is this idea of the sunk cost fallacy and then for those people who don't know what it is the sunk cost fallacy is when you put a lot of lot into something, it's hard to let it go. So you may have had this with like, you signed up for a course, halfway through the course, you hate the course, but you're like, I put in all this time, I can't let it go. Or I, I put all this time in this job, even though I hate it, I better stick with it. When, when realistically, your best option is to cut and move forward. Why keep doing something that's not bringing you, you, you joy, but that's the sunk cost fallacy. Mm -hmm. And you know, kids aren't sunk costs, but in some senses, they are a little bit to your brain because when they're young, you're doing every, everything for them. You're not getting much back. I mean, yeah, yeah. you're getting smiles and maybe hugs, but you know, you're changing diapers, you're, you're feeding them, you're up all night, and it can be very, very stressful. Well, if you look at ethnographically, who has the, the, the closest relationship with their kids in terms of actual physical contact, time spent with them, et cetera, it's, it's typically the Japanese. Now, nowadays it's more Japanese moms because of, of, the, of, the, of the way the work culture is there. The dads work huge amounts of time and that's not a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. But they've developed this emotion called amai, which is distinct to them, which is basically this, this emotion of like, 
cherishing your child. You can think when you're working and your child comes up to you and pulls on your pants and wants you to read a story and that feeling you have like, oh gosh, okay. And one reason I think they do this is because if you look at Shinto, which is the, the national kind of religion of Japan, one that most people practice, the first year is loaded, actually, the, actually all of childhood, but especially the first year or two is loaded with multiple ceremonies, right? Mm. When the mom is pregnant, you have a ceremony where people come in and, and put a sash around her belly to protect the child. When the child's born, you have a ceremony. When the child um, uh, you know, has his first meal, you do a ceremony. When there's a blessing ceremony, the first birthday, there's a ceremony. There's all these things. And when you think about it, what you're doing is in those ceremonies, parents are always giving thanks publicly to their, mm. to their, for their child. They're also publicly spending a lot of money to organize these rituals and rites. And what it's doing is it's reminding you in a very public way that you can't forget that you value this child. So we all think you know, we, we care for something because, because we love it, and that's true. But the psychologist Alison Gopnik also said, sometimes we love because we care. Yeah. What she means by that is the simple act of engaging in the effort of caring makes us think, well, I must really love this, <laughs> this, this thing. And so um, it convinces our mind that, that these, these, this little creature that's stressing us out is really, really, really worthwhile. And so what I recommend, you know, you, if, you see, if you see physicians, often pediatricians say to parents, well, if you're having trouble bonding with your baby, set time away to spend time with it, to read it, read to it, mm. to massage it. Um, what you're doing is creating little rituals that mm. show you value this child. When, I, when my kids were young, we would do half birthdays instead of just one, you know, yearly birthdays to have an extra ceremony where we actually show them how much we love them and just things like that because of the way your mind works will reinforce how much you really value this child and just tend to reinforce that connection that you have. Yeah. As I was reading, uh, uh, that, that section, I was, I, I kept thinking about my son's first birthday, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you ask anybody, you know, like, hey, what was your first birthday like? None of us remember. But no. we we probably spent more money on his first birthday yeah. than any other birthday. I'm thinking about that. Like, there were like balloons. We were actually living in uh, California during that time, and all our families here in Nevada, and they came out there just so. It was such a big thing for his first birthday, and I, and I, you know, so I was thinking about that as we were reading. Like, no, you're right, and and it's for him, but he has no memory or experience. We probably slept through half of it, yeah. but <laughs> but that's exactly right. But if you look at Shinto, they take that first birthday, but they have that size celebration so many multiple times during the first year and even, you know, in multiple times after that. And it's just a way of just reinforcing how much this child means to you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, like, uh, like you were talking about it in the book, like these are things that we're already doing. And maybe if we like understood a little bit and we can understand, I think, you know, one of the more important parts is, you know, I, I, there's often like this divide between like atheists and believers and, you know, and it's just like, Hey, we're doing a lot of the same things for the same reasons, even though we might not even, you know, realize it. But one of the, one of the topics that like, I'm so interested in is morality. Yeah. Right. And you talk a little bit about that. I'm hoping you could better explain it to me because I've read about it in a few books. And I'm trying to fully grasp, uh, get my head around it. But it's it's this kind of uh, why we evolved to believe or, uh, uh, you know, one of the strongest theories, which is like this kind of accountability aspect. And we see like. Yeah, you could probably explain this better, but we see how it kind of changes the larger societies get, sure. right? Can you explain yeah. the hypothesis behind that and why that kind of works out the way it does? Yeah, so um, there's a few things there. One thing, and, and, and this is work by, by, by Joe Henrich and, and colleagues, um, mm. what you see is if you, is if you chart the growth of societies over time, where uh, initially, right, lots of smaller societies had kind of, a transactional relationship with their gods. There are lots of little gods or spirits. And if you wanted something, you gave them an offering and they gave you something back. Mm -hmm. But when we start seeing these kind of what they're called, they're called big gods. What they mean by that is kind of omniscient, all-knowing gods. And this is the gods of the, of the kind of the, the Abrahamic religions today, or in some ways, even like Buddhism and Hinduism, because they have this idea of karma, which is the same thing. And the idea is someone 
whether it's God or the scales of karma, mm -hmm. knows what you're doing and can keep track of it. So in a small society, if I were going to cheat you, Chris, it'd be hard for me to hide. If I were going to be freeloading on people, it'd be hard for me to hide. Everybody would kind of know it and I would get social, um, socially ostracized or, or sanctioned for doing that. But as societies got bigger, it became easy to cheat, yeah. right? If I'm a scribe in a temple recording taxes or grain offerings, I can embezzle a little bit. Who's going to know, right? If same thing, you know, now if I, if I cheat in certain ways, it's easy to cheat because society is so big. No one's seeing exactly what everybody's doing. And so you saw these, at least this is the theory that they have. You saw these big gods emerge to keep cooperation going because suddenly maybe the, your friend or your neighbor wouldn't know if you were cheating someone in these larger societies, but God knows, mm -hmm. karma knows, and you're going to pay a price for that. Because if you think about morality, really most of morality boils down to kind of cooperation, right? If mm -hmm. you give me money, if I don't pay you back, I'm ahead. But if I don't pay you back, you're never going to want to interact with me again. And so over time, I'm going to lose those benefits. That's why I do it. If you cheat on your spouse, um, that may feel good to you in the moment. But when that person finds out long term, it's going to ruin that relationship. So morality is a lot about suppressing your desire for immediate gratification, accepting mm -hmm. a sacrifice in the moment to do something that's better for everyone. And that's, that's the idea uh, behind you know, what some of these moralistic religions do. But the other thing that I like to talk about in my book is, you know, God or someone can tell you, be good, don't lie, don't cheat. Mm. It doesn't always work. I mean, you know, in, 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 in studies we have in my lab, 100% of people say, say they wouldn't cheat on a task. And, and some of them are lying, but I think the majority <laughs> don't, aren't lying. They just don't think they would. But when we, you know, push comes to shove and we give them an anonymity and they can save a lot of time or earn a lot of money, mm -hmm. a good percentage of them will cheat. And they'll create a story for why it was okay so they feel justified. Um, and so what, what religions do are they, they also give us these tools that help us combat that, right? So I told you before, when you feel gratitude, you become more, more moral, less likely to cheat. And there's mm -hmm. lots of other tools like that. So it's not just from the top down, be good. It's from the bottom up, changing your beliefs, changing your feelings that, that help you fight temptation. So here's, here's where I struggle. And I, I'm guessing you have some answers for me. So, so morality, it's a lot about cooperation, right? This, you know, evolving to believe in a God, societies grow bigger. That makes sense. Like, I, I'm not going to do some shady stuff, even though I think I can get away with it you know, and all that. But so a common, uh, a common argument I, I see, you know, from uh, a lot of people from different religious backgrounds, well, mainly Christianity is, if we don't have God, we don't have morality, and then the whole world turns into chaos, right? And yeah. I'm like, well, no, that's, you know, that yeah, I can look outside and yeah. see how many people don't believe and they're not running around raping, killing, murdering, stealing, right. all, all sorts of stuff, right? But at the same time, how do we explain that? How do we explain how people have moved further away from, you know, uh, not just organized religion, but we have more and more people just being, you know, atheists doing their own thing, but society's still running. We're still cooperating. Like, is this just some kind of, is this more just cooperation being built into us, do you think, than the God, the God stuff? Yeah, I mean, so let me, let me say, I, I don't believe you need religion to be a good person. Uh, and as you're saying, I, I think that's exactly, that's exactly right. You know, I mean, you know, Nietzsche said, you know, God is dead. We have killed him when, when this, you know, secularization movement really, really was taking off mm -hmm. um, and the world was going to burn. You know, it, it didn't, right. We're, we're still here. Um, the, and if you look at that big God data, the one point they make is in, is in really modern complex societies. Um, that have really good rules of law that people adhere to, the effect of those big moralistic gods isn't as large because we've built into our society guardrails mm. and expectations. But, right, human nature is always back and forth between, you know, uh, what's good for me now in the moment uh, to gain power or resources and, and the fact that we have to cooperate to all live together. 
And so when the rules of law begin to be violated, and you can see this now in, in, in politics as we're beginning to, to um, what's the word I'm looking for, kind of denigrate uh, institutions and not believe in these institutions that provided guardrails for the rule of law, chaos is breaking out uh, yeah. in ways that are, 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 are frightening. Um, and so, you know, I, I think religion is just one set of tools that, that can help people be more moral. Now, I should say, right, my, the whole point of this book is religion offers tools that nudge the mind. On average, they help people live better lives. But like any tool or any technology, they can be used for nefarious purposes too. Because people always say, mm. well, Dave, don't you know religion is the source of war and kill? I'm like, yeah, but that was because it was the intentions of the people who were using the tools. It's not baked into religion itself. Okay. So that, that kind of leads me to my next question. Maybe it's the same answer. So, and you know, like, I don't want to get too political, but like there's, because there's plenty of, there's plenty of people on the left who are religious, right? But mm -hmm. I'm looking to understand, because in the book, like, you know, you talk about like people who are more religious or, or they pray, they're less likely to cheat. And like, you know, there's been some research around this and stuff and less likely doesn't mean impossible. But, but for example, on the topic of morality, like when I look at, you know, politicians, uh, especially on the right, who push these kind of ideas of like, uh, you know, um, they're they're against, you know, abortion, you know, the pro gun laws and all these other things that, you know, uh, a lot of, are against like gay marriage and just things like that. Right. But then these scandals break out. Right. They're stealing or, or yeah. doing something or cheating or just insane things. And I'm like, OK, how do we explain that? Is this is this should I be thinking of that as like just these one-off situations? Because I think that's what a lot of atheists say. Like, why would I ever do any religious stuff? Look at that religious guy who's yeah. cheating and stealing and all that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, a few things there. And, and let me say one thing. It's, it's not that that religious people tend to be always more honest. It, 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 really, mm. it, it really depends, right? So people who are engaged in their faiths uh. tend to be more honest. People who just say, oh, I'm religious and are like, you know, a poser of like using it, they're not more, they're not, they're not more honest. So it, it's certainly not a guarantee. But I think what you're seeing there is, well, some of it is, is people using, using religion as a tool. I said, it's mm. really powerful. You can motivate people to do all kinds of things with it. And so a lot of politicians, dictators, everybody else will use it as a tool. But when you talk about things like, like abortion or the death penalty, I, I kind of want to separate, and this is not a cop-out, but I want to separate what I'm looking at from theology. Right. Okay. So religions set, or set out social policies that are beliefs about theology and, and what is a sin and was not a sin. And mm. on a general level, they all kind of begin most basic stuff like, right, thou shalt not kill. We should be honest. You should care for your fellow neighbor. But when they start, sec you know, looking at very specific theological elements and policies, that may or may not appeal to people based on what they believe. To me, that's the institutional part of religion, just like the Republican Party, the Catholic Church, right, or the or, or or a group of or you know the certain sects of Islam or whatever it might be, have certain theological policies. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are the spiritual practices and and rituals that we engage in. Those mm. are helpful. Got it. The policy standpoints you may or may not agree with for lots of reasons. And I think a lot of people now are, are leaving religion because they don't agree with those policies politically, or, you know, a lot of people are leaving uh, churches because a Catholic church, because like, you know, women can't be priests, there's gender discrimination, there's all kinds of things going on. And so I think we're in this period where what we believe is right and what we believe is factual is in flux from these traditional standpoints of these religions that have been around for a long time, which is why mm. I think people are looking for new ways to be spiritual because the theology of these other faiths don't speak or resonate to them anymore, but they still feel a need for something in their life. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That, that, that helps make a little bit more sense of it. So, <laughs> so now when I kind of look at this, but yeah, I've, I, I, I think, you know, I've, I've recognized this too. I've seen more churches pop up where they're like, Hey, we're LGBTQ inclusive. We're, you know, and all, all sorts of things, even like I mentioned 
being here in Las Vegas growing up, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 36. So kind of like in that millennial age, and I've seen even certain aspects of the Mormon churches, just, you know, at least here in Las Vegas, Utah's next door. I think that's a different story because that's like the hub, but things are, have shifted a little bit here. Like uh, one of my good friends, his, his brother came out as gay in high school. It was really, uh, you know, an issue at first, but now it's more like accepted and, and, and things like that. And I don't know if it's just specific to, you know, this anecdote or our city or whatever, but it is, it is cool seeing it kind of modernize and become a little bit more loose with some of that stuff or people just starting their own things. Um, yeah. And all, I mean, I mean, all religions that exist now exist because somebody figured out there was a better way or they spoke to people in a different mm. way. Right. You know, I mean, that, that's how different sects arise. And there are new religions arising all the time. The ones that last are the ones that speak to certain people's values and, mm. and needs and, and meet them. But really what they do besides forming belief is they form a community, right? And that's what in many ways helps people at all stages of life. You know, loneliness is as bad for you in terms of, of morbidity statistics as is smoking, oh, yeah. as is drinking. And, you know, religions form community. And so one of the things that, that we studied in my lab was how do we make people feel more connected? And so we studied this idea of, of what's called motor synchrony. It's moving together in time. And you know, you see this when you, if you see a flock of birds moving together or yeah. a school of fish, suddenly it doesn't seem like individuals. It seems like things that are together. And so we brought people into the lab and we had them just put on earphones and simply uh, tap a sensor in front of them with tones and the tones were either rigged so that they were in sync. So people were moving their arms in sync or they were random and they weren't. After that, we asked people how, you know, how similar are you guys to that, to that person? They never met. I mean, never met before. They never talked yeah. that simple act of moving together in time. People reported being more similar than if they moved out of time. Um, they reported feeling more compassion when we took one person mm. in each group and we had, we, got them stuck doing some god awful task and they also became about 30 percent more likely to say hey that person got stuck doing this god awful test can i go help them yeah right and so this was a little life pack to simply make in that moment turn strangers into friends who are willing to do something for each other i thought well this is great but every religion we looked at that's what you see yeah. people people kneel and stand and sing together and it's it's forming that sense of community and reinforcing it among strangers and, and in lots of different ways. And I think that's, that's a, another fundamental, fundamental way why, how, how religions build, um, build resilience in people. Yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things I saw just, you know, going to 12 step meetings and I, I get kind of defensive, you know, there's all these things like, oh, it's like cult, it's this, they force God on you and stuff. And, but I saw all these like benefits mm -hmm. that people like yourself have proven with science. It was the community and, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people struggling with like depression and stuff, like very isolated, very alone and doing things like, you know, uh, for example, I was going to three meetings a day with similar groups of people, right? That was me building this community. And then there's certain you know rituals i think rituals just even saying that gives kind of like this woo woo kind of feeling but yeah just things we do regularly but um i i have a few more questions that i have sure. to i have to ask you before i let you go because you are a researcher you're very scientific method and all that and here's something that i struggle with because i'm like yeah science all right so there have been a lot of debates about like scientists being religious right and religion and science so i'm not so much like can religious and science kind of like overlap like of course it can but here's where i struggle david i'm hoping you can help explain this to me so when i think of like a scientist who is a church going or regardless of their religion like very religious to me it feels like at some point like at some point in that process there, there's going to be this wall where they hit their religion, right? Where it seems like their beliefs, because it seems like, you know, when you grow up of a faith, it is just so deeply ingrained in you, it's going to be hard to be completely science minded or objective. So well, I'm curious your thoughts on, on that with when it I think, to... I mean, I think it really depends what you're researching. So, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, Francis Collins, who's head of NIH right now, is a, is a person who is who is deeply religious oh. in of faith right but he you know he, and he formed this organization called biologos which is designed to say look religious people don't take the bible literally evolution is real etc right 
but you know, I, I, I think you can have faith in, in where that maybe God had a hand in, in, in the creation of the world, but still believe that the way it operates now and the science we use to understand it and our ability to understand that is a gift from, from that God. Mm -hmm. I think where it becomes a problem is if you are so, so devoted to a faith and that faith makes strong claims about the thing that you are researching, Mm. then it can be a problem. Um, but for a lot of scientists, you know, I, I don't know that the things they're researching are related to their beliefs. But if you believe that, you know, God put you on this earth and you can use the tools that you have to study that creation using the scientific method, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, but I think it, you know, it just it just depends. I mean, no scientist, even if even if I'm doing an experiment even if I'm not religious, but I have a really strong view that my idea has to be right. Mm -hmm. That's not good for any scientist, right? You have to follow the data. And as I tell people, that's what got me here, right? I'm not here on an agenda saying religion is good. I'm here after doing lots of work saying, gee, a lot of the things I'm studying that I see work religions have been using, maybe there's something here. And so it's, it's, it's following that data, right? On the other side, there are people like, you know, Richard Dawkins or Steve Pinker, who are so against the idea of, of religion mm. as a superstition that they think it's, it's, it's an extremely harmful thing to look at and it can have no redeeming elements. And I'm mm. like, guys, look at the data. We're not arguing about does God, believe, does God exist, but if you look at the data, there are benefits to it. And I think for some of those folks, it's hard to actually accept that. And so I think no matter when you're a scientist, whether it's a theological belief or just a strongly held notion you've got to be willing to go where the data takes you and not try and force it to be what you want it to be yeah and and david i think you just blew my brain up because that makes sense too some people can be so atheistic like when i think of you know like really devout devout atheists it's you know uh just toting this idea like i am scientific that's why i don't believe in anything but For example, your book has plenty of research and plenty of data. So you could be so against religion that you neglect some of that stuff. And I guess that's a concern I would have for somebody being like a religious scientist, right? Right, right, exactly. And, you know, my argument is, look, let's not argue about the theology, whether God exists or not. Let's just study these things scientifically in a respectful way. And I and I think that's been that's a huge, a huge benefit. Yeah, um, that that actually perfectly transitions into one of the last questions I was going to ask you because mm-hmm. I've seen you, you know, on on Twitter. I think you and I even talked a little bit about this. Like, there are, you know, the the new atheists with, you know, like mm-hmm. Dawkins and I, I think uh, we talked a little bit about Sam Harris and all that. Like, for example, and I, you know, uh, I think so, it's kind of a spectrum. Like Sam Harris, one of the books that really helped me actually when I got sober was his book. Uh, waking up and it was like yeah. spirituality without religion and it wasn't so much you know uh like uh like your research and everything but he just kind of talked about the practices because he's really into meditation gets into uh some psychedelics and stuff which you talk about a little yeah. bit in your book as well but i'm curious i'm curious your thoughts like it, it almost seems like in for certain people atheism has almost become sort of like this religion like i noticed right i come from a youtube background there are a lot of like YouTube channels that are purely based around atheism. Like there's even like conferences for atheists. Uh, when I go to the the bookstore, I'm browsing books or some books on atheism. And it's like 300 pages telling you why God doesn't exist. I'm like, isn't this a little much? So like, when it's talk- like, <laughs> it's like any other identity that we map onto, just like Republican uh, versus Democrat. Yeah. Conservatives. And, and everybody's entitled to their own. Right. I don't, you know, and I'm not going to tell you atheism is wrong or Catholicism, right. Or Judaism is wrong. Right. That's up to you. But when you're out there making such a strong case as a scientist, right. I can't tell you God doesn't, doesn't exist. I can tell you I see no strong evidence that God exists, yeah. but I can't tell you that God doesn't exist. And any scientist, when push comes to shove, will, will have to admit that, right? So let's not, let's not, when you're having those books on either side, it's yeah. really just agenda driven, right? Yeah. Based on a social identity. But, but I'm here, so, so here's what I think, of, right? So let's look at, before we go, one big problem I talk about in the book is how people deal with grief, mm. right? 
And um, if you look at religions, the way that they deal with grief is tremendously helpful and insightful in ways that scientists are only now figuring out. So when somebody dies, what's one thing all religions do when you go to a funeral? Mm -hmm. You eulogize the person. You talk about why this person was a good person. Now that seems normal, but if you think about it, Chris, it's kind of strange. If I just lost a job I loved or my partner who I loved dumped mm. me, I wouldn't want to spend time thinking about how wonderful that job or partner was. Cause it sucks. I don't have them anymore, right? That would yeah. make me miserable, but we do it. Why do we do it? Well, work by George Bonanno, who's one of the world's major grief researchers shows that when you have, when you can solidify positive memories of a person who is gone, it's one of the big predictors of, of limiting grief. And in fact, people who are more depressed and more anxious and more paralyzed in grief can't make those memories. Mm. What's the biggest predictor of, of coming through grief? Instrumental support. That's not social support. It's not like how many followers you have on Twitter. Yeah. It's who shows up. And if you look at like Judaism and sitting Shiva, it's a mitzvot. It's a, it's a sacred obligation that you must go to these people's houses and visit them and bring food and support mm. them. And when you go, they say these prayers in groups that are called minions where people are praying together. And you know what? They're doing this and they're chanting together and moving together. That, as we just talked about before, reinforces compassion and connection. They cover their mirrors in Shiva or in Irish wakes or in Hindu ceremonies. Why do they cover their mirrors? It seems strange. Well, there's, science, there's lots of scientific research that shows self-focus, even specifically looking in a mirror intensifies whatever emotion you're feeling. And so if you're, if you're mourning, looking in a mirror is going to intensify your grief. Mm. And so there are all these little nudges packaged in, in ways that figured out a long time ago, factors that we are just learning now that mitigate grief. And so my argument is, let's go look and see what else there is that we can put to the test and that we can help people use and bring into their own traditions and their own, their own habits. Yeah, no, I, I love how you said that. And, and yeah, just to, just to wrap this up, like, you know, for the book, like, I'm curious, who, who do you hope is, is going to read this book? And it might be both of these, like, when I think I'm like, is this mainly for non believers to show them the scientific evidence and the research that kind of the benefits of these kind of rituals, or is it kind of like, you know, religious people too to be like, hey, there's actually some research behind this that shows why this stuff works, who, who are you hoping picks this book up? I, uh, you know, I, well, of course I want everybody to pick it everybody. up, right? <laughs> but, but realistically it's, 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 it's both. I mean, I'm sure there are some hardcore atheists who will just not countenance it at all. There are some hardcore kind of fundamentalist or Orthodox religious folks who won't countenance at all, but everybody in between, I want to think about it because if you're a person who's not religious, I want you to see that these traditions have some things that you might use. And for people who are religious, I want you to say, oh, that's why I do this in my faith. And here's how it works. And it might encourage people who are kind of on the fence and religious to adopt some more of those. And again, my, my goal isn't to make anyone religious or not religious. It's to foster a conversation between two areas of life that mm. have become more diametrically opposed to help us all hopefully figure out ways to make life better for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. I think I mentioned this on Twitter when I was reading uh, reading the book. It's like, I, if I was still working in a rehab, I would just hand this out to everybody. Like, look, here's some here's some reasons why we do this. But but David, thank you so much for your time. The book is out now. So could you tell everybody, like, is it available uh, internationally? Like, is it available everywhere? And where can people find you to keep up to date with your research? And when you write your next book? Yeah, sure. So the book is called, right, right, How God Works, The Science Behind Religion's Benefits. It's available in the US and Canada right now. Uh, it comes out in the UK and Commonwealth countries on the, uh, I think at the end of October. Yeah. Um, but if you want to find anything else about it, you can come to my website, which is www.davedesteno, D-E-S-T-E-N-O.com, or I'm at, at David Desteno on Twitter. Beautiful. Awesome. And I'll link all that down in the description below. And yeah, again, love, love the book. Thanks so much for your time. And, and yeah, I'm sure we'll be doing this again some other time. Thanks, Chris.